Throughout history, people have had an urge to record their lives through images. The earliest known cave painting is more than 64,000 years old and was made by a Neanderthal. The oldest surviving photograph is from 1826, and the first digital photograph was created in 1957. And now we all carry around an amazing camera in our pockets. And that leads us to pics or it didn't happen. Today we are gonna learn about air and space photography and we are gonna train some photography students right here at the National Air and Space Museum. This, this is 730. Hi, I'm Beth. And I'm Marty. And welcome to the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum's Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center. Today, we are gonna talk about photography. When we film episodes of STEM and 30, we are surrounded by a variety of cameras. We have an FS7, which is our main camera, and allows us to switch lenses if needed to give a nice wide shot or a good tight shot. We use a Sony A7, which is a DSLR. This is our side shot or secondary shot. We have one on a steady rig that allows us to move the camera and maintain a steady shot. We also use much smaller cameras like GoPros. These give us a really wide shot and allows us to put cameras in places we can't fit our other cameras. Sometimes we even use our cell phones. All of these cameras have something in common. They all capture images. Photography is creating images by recording light either electronically by using an image sensor or chemically by means of light sensitive materials like photographic film. The very first photograph was taken in France in 1826. It was rather crude and took at least eight hours of exposure time. But since then, advancements in chemistry and technology have made it possible for people to take photographs simply by pulling cameras out of their pockets or bags. While the use of crude cameras, such as the camera obscura, which allowed artists to trace a projected image, have been around since the 1500s, photography as we know it began as a chemical process. Beginning with the daguerreotype, the first publicly available photographic process used in the 1840s and the 1850s. Invented by Louis Degar, the daguerreotype used a chemical process that fixed images to a piece of silver-plated copper. The copper plate was placed in the camera, exposed to light, which produced an image that was fixed by exposing it to mercury vapor. This highly toxic, cumbersome process produced an easily damaged image that was then placed in a case to keep it safe. Other chemical processes were introduced gained popularity and were quickly replaced until George Eastman introduced photographic film. In 1885, Eastman received a patent for a film roll and then invented a camera that could contain the preloaded film. In 1888, he released the Kodak camera, which was loaded with enough roll film for 100 exposures. Photographers would buy the camera, take the pictures, and mail it back to the Eastman company along with $10. That's about $320 in today's money. The company would process the film, make a print of each exposure, load another roll of film into the camera, and send it back along with the photographs. Then in 1901, Kodak introduced the Kodak Brownie camera, bringing what we now refer to as the snapshot to anyone who wanted to take pictures anywhere, anytime. Film photography long ruled the platform. Then, in 1988, Fujifilm produced the first digital camera that could record and save images in a digital format. Since then, digital cameras have taken over the photography industry, with an estimated 99% of people using digital cameras, increasingly on their phones. The first phone with a camera came out in 1999. Early photographers were always sad. They spent so much time processing the negatives. Let's dive into the inner workings of a camera. Cameras are amazing devices. 
At the press of a button, they take a snapshot of the world and freeze a moment in time. Almost everyone has a camera, but how do they work? The principles behind taking a photo are the same for every kind of camera. Before digital cameras, like the ones in your phone, there were film cameras. When you take a picture, light reflects off your subject, enters the front of the camera, and then passes through a series of lenses, which bends the light or refracts it to project a mirror image onto the film behind it. Film is a type of plastic coated with photosensitive chemicals, which means when exposed to light, it changes brightness. Once it's been exposed, people are able to take the film and use chemicals to fix it, removing its photosensitivity and leaving a negative, which is then used to print photographs. A digital camera uses the same principles, but instead of refracting the light onto film, it does so onto a sensor, which then converts the light it receives into data which it stores as a file that can be shared. You'll notice that the light that passes onto the sensor is mirrored when it moves through the lens. This is how convex lenses work. A convex lens is a lens thicker in the middle than on the edges, giving it an outward curve. A concave lens is a lens that is thicker on the edges and has an inward curve. When light passes through a convex lens, it refracts the light and focuses it onto a point. If you keep going, that light ends up on the opposite point from where it started on the other side of the lens, which is where our camera captures the mirror image. This is the same reason that looking through a magnifying glass from far away looks upside down. It's a convex lens. The principles behind cameras are very similar to the principles behind telescopes. Light reflects off an object, passes through the lens on the front, and is projected onto an eyepiece, which magnifies it many times so the viewer can see the faraway object up close. Hopefully now you have an understanding of how cameras and telescopes work. Not only are we going to learn about photography today, but we are going to train a fleet of aspiring photographers. And joining us is Kevin Smith. He is the professional photography teacher at Fairfax Academy. Kevin, tell us a little bit about what you do. Certainly. I teach at uh, Fairfax Academy. I teach professional photography intro, level one and level two. And we focus on the industry side at Fairfax Academy. Every high school has photography teaching the art side. So we teach you the professional side, how you can make some money, or maybe some of our students just want to go to the next level and have a better idea of what they want to do at a higher education level with photography. Kevin is going to be our instructor here at the museum today. He's going to take our group of students and teach them some basic photography. These photography tips will apply to all photography, no matter what camera you're using. In our line of work, it doesn't matter what camera you use. We, we believe that it's not the wand, it's the magician. And so we're gonna start today with compositional rules. We're gonna talk a little bit about perspective, different angles, and touch on a little bit of lighting and show that as, as long as you're doing those techniques, doesn't matter what you shoot with. After our students learn some basics, they're gonna go on a photography walk around the museum. Once they take their pictures, they're gonna do some basic processing. This processing is a lot different than when I was studying photography. We used to have to take our film, process it, and then print our pictures. There was no checking a selfie in a viewfinder. Once those pictures are done, they're actually gonna go on display right here at the museum. There are students now. Kevin, we're gonna let you focus on the students. We can't wait to see what develops. Excellent, I'm looking forward to the opportunity. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Kevin Smith. I'm the professional photography instructor at Fairfax Academy. Welcome. We're excited for you guys to be here today to learn a little bit about photography. What you're gonna learn today is gonna make you take a better picture. So what we're gonna talk about today is compositional rules. But I really want you guys to focus on four rules today. And they're gonna be rule of thirds, triangular design, frame within a frame, and leading lines. So the first one that we're gonna talk about is rule of thirds. Imagine taking your screen and dividing it into thirds. So this is our image area here, and we've divided it into thirds, both horizontally and vertically. Then we're generally gonna put our subject 
in the center. But we've learned that they actually look better when they're not in the center. So we're gonna pick one of these lines right here and we're gonna put our subject on that line. So that's rule of thirds for you. But then to take it to the next level, we're gonna introduce these intersecting points right here, which we call golden means. These areas right here are the more visually interesting areas on the page. Triangular design to me is one of the most difficult ones because we're not actually going around taking pictures of physical triangles. It's how we take the picture and compose it to create the triangle. In here, we're creating negative space on the side. So the blue area right here is somewhat of a triangle, right? This one to me is probably the easiest one to understand. Frame within a frame. It could be as simple as one side, two, three, or four. We often use our compositional rules to help define our subject the leading line that's leading in to our actual subject. Can we have more than one compositional rule in the picture? 100% guys, the more compositional rules we have in there, the more aesthetically pleasing your picture is gonna be. All right guys, before we go take pictures, I wanna introduce you to some of my students that I brought to help out you guys and collaborate with you while we're taking photos. First we have Rafi, then we have Elliot, next we have Daniel, and Mamuna. Okay guys, now we have some of our student work that I brought with me that has the compositional rules we talked about. I'm gonna put them on the table here and I want you guys to go through them and decide what rules each one of the photos have. So you guys have now learned about rule of thirds, triangular design, leading lines, and frame within a frame. But you know why we really came here? So we can go take some pictures. Guys, let's go take some pictures. I think our students are in very capable hands. I do too, and I think it's cool that they're using a variety of equipment. One student has a DSLR, one has a point and shoot, and a couple are using cell phones. But equipment can only take you so far. A great photograph tells a great story. One of our curators is an expert at reading images. She took a look at the famous picture of Buzz Aldrin on the moon. You can see the whole video by scanning the QR code. But at the end, she tells how to read an image and why it's important. So in looking at this image and analyzing it and analyzing any image, a strategy to take and what I was trained to do is to really read it just like you would read a page on a, in a book. You read it left to right, top to bottom, and it really allows you to analyze every single bit of the image for information, information you might not otherwise get from just glancing at an image or even reading text. There's lots of ways to interpret images, but there are symbols within these images that help us understand and get a deeper understanding of the events depicted in the image. Images are an important part of history. You can learn a lot by reading an image, not just reading text. Let's take a look at the Wright Brothers' famous first flight image. What's amazing about this is that I've looked at this image a thousand times and there were still things I didn't see. Looking at images can also help clear up misconceptions. Check it out. 
Hi, my name is Tom Crouch. I'm the senior curator of aeronautics at the National Air and Space Museum. And I've been studying, thinking, reading about, and writing about the Wright brothers for a long time. And here is the famous picture of the world's first airplane just leaving the rail on its first flight. So let's take a look at it. The picture was taken on December 17, 1903. It's about 10.35 in the morning. They're at a place called the Kill Devil Hills, about four miles south of a little fishing village called Kitty Hawk. Now on this first flight, Orville was doing the piloting. He only kept the airplane in the air for about 120 feet, uh, 12 seconds all told. Uh, they made four flights that morning and uh, each one was a little longer than the one before it. By the time it was Wilbur's turn for the fourth flight, he actually flew 852 feet down the beach and he was in the air for 59 seconds. And this is Orville, who is laying down on the uh, lower wing. And this is Wilbur, who was running alongside the airplane, looking kind of surprised. When you look at this photograph of the world's first airplane, what are you really looking at? Well, these two biplane wings, uh, about 40 feet, four inches across, they're covered with unbleached muslin. And you have wood struts. So if you look at the airplane, there, it doesn't have any wheels. That's because they're going to fly from sand and the wheels would sink into the sand. So the notion they came up with was to run the airplane, get flying speed, running down a monorail track. Just a wooden beam on little cross pieces with a metal cap strip. And the airplane runs down the track on this thing which is a trolley. And when it takes off, the trolley just drops off. So that's where it is. And as you can see from the photograph, that day, the airplane didn't have to run very far down the track to take off. As you can see, it's not even over the end of the track and it's already in the air. So where did it start? Well, that's kind of neat. If you look back here, you can see the outline of the wing in the sand. Now, how come it's outlined in the sand? Well, before they started the flight, everybody was walking around the airplane, checking things and so on. So where the wing was at the beginning of the flight, they outlined with their feet, which is kind of neat. There you have it. That's kind of deconstructing uh, the photograph of the world's first airplane on its first flight. Even before that image of the Wright brothers' first flight was taken, cameras were being taken into the air. Aerial photography has had a long and interesting history, and it continues today. Photos have been taken from the air in many ways, from kites to balloons, airplanes, and even pigeons. During World War I, military observers used balloons to watch and photograph the enemy and their movements. However, the war saw the rapid development of airplanes, including reconnaissance aircraft. At first, pilots would observe enemy troop movements from the sky and would verbally report their observations after landing. However, newer two-seat airplanes made room for both a pilot and an observer with a camera, but no room for a gunner. These quickly became the new standard, and aerial photos became an important, albeit dangerous, part of military planning. Spying from the sky continued to play an important role in military operations during World War II, with the D-Day invasion being one of the largest photo reconnaissance jobs in history. American and British aerial missions took millions of photographs, which provided important reconnaissance, which helped secure the Allied victory on the Normandy beaches. Spying from the air played a key role in the Cold War by collecting accurate information vital to foreign policy and military operations. Reconnaissance aircraft like the SR-71 Blackbird were operational from 1966 to 1990. The Blackbird carried a wide array of photographic film cameras and other sensors to collect intelligence. 
Corona spy satellites launched by the CIA took pictures from space. Unlike today, where satellites collect digital images and beam them back to Earth, the Corona satellite photographs were captured on film and sent back to Earth in capsules. These images then had to be developed and printed before they could be used. When we think of aerial photography, we often think of reconnaissance or spying. And while spying is an important function of aerial photography, it's not its only use. Digital imaging has made photographs taken from the air or even space easier to examine. Today, digital images from drones monitor pollution and aid in search and rescue. Satellite images help create and update maps we use on Earth. Aerial photography has been used to track temperature changes, deforestation, and even shoot movies. Another use for aerial photography is archaeology, where archaeologists use drones and satellite images as one tool to help survey a site from the air instead of possibly disturbing it from the ground. Most of us carry a high quality camera wherever we go. Photography is more accessible now than ever before. But there are some places that cameras can't reach to take pictures. Like the top shelf? Or outer space. We are joined by the astronauts of Crew 4. Thank you all so much for being with us today. My pleasure. Thank you. We know that photography is important. Tell us about training to be an astronaut photographer. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've got an amazing training program across the board, but we do get specific training um, on how to use the cameras and how to take pictures both inside the space station of the science that we're doing and also pictures on the outside. And so really from the day that we start our assigned crew training through the time that we fly, we meet with our um, photo instructors, photo TV instructors, um, on a fairly regular basis to go over the wide array of equipment because we're not only dealing with our handheld cameras, but we have video cameras and an assortment of other cameras that we use both for inside and exterior um, filming. It's, it's amazing to get one-on-one -on -one instruction like that on how, how to take pictures. We spend a little bit of time trying to take pictures around our simulator outside to develop those techniques. But what I shared with these guys as we were preparing is that you don't know how to take the pictures you're gonna to need to take. And it's really trial by fire. You get up there and then you just start taking pictures. And so I don't know how long into it that you start to feel comfortable, maybe a month, month or two, or so, yeah. that you really start to, you know, the settings for a particular type of shot, whether it's Aurora or taking a picture of a city at night, you start to learn what works for you. And so it's really just trial and error to get to the point that at the, by the end of the mission, we're able to produce some of the stunning photos that we're, we're able to take. There are a few different locations on board the International Space Station that we're able to take photographs of the Earth. Um, our, one of our favorites is the cupola. Uh, so it has seven windows uh, to the, the world, uh, windows to the world really, where you can watch the, the Earth go by um, and really provides more of a wide view of the Earth. And so that enables us to, to capture a little bit more um, and have a bit more context for what we're taking photos of. And then we also have the the, um, the WARF, the Window Observation Research Facility, which is in our lab uh, module. And there um, we're able to, to similarly um, go in and take excellent pictures of the Earth um, in kind of a, a more higher resolution um, type of way. And so it's really neat to have those opportunities to take pictures um, for several different reasons, one of which is for scientific observation. So we are able to take photos of the Earth and look for surface processes and how they're changing over time. We can look for natural hazards that are occurring during our mission, so hurricanes, fires, volcanic eruptions, things like that, um, and really just be able to see Earth from kind of a planetary perspective, which is really neat. Uh, you know, being in space, we get to do some incredible things, uh, but to me, it was really, really important to be able to share that experience. And, and we're, you know, we're such visually oriented uh, species that uh, photography was a very natural way to do that. And so uh, to be able to, you know, 
to take these pictures of just this amazing perspective that we have uh, on our planet and the cosmos was uh, was really incredible. Uh, you know, and we have we're we're really blessed up there to have such a wide array of cameras and lenses and and the and clearly a great spot location 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 <laughs> right uh, to to take these pictures and so that was really really. Uh, important to me uh, and and a real payoff, uh, you know, to really be able to uh, for us to take these pictures and then uh, share with you know with everybody uh, what that experience and what that perspective uh, that we have up there. Awesome. Well, thanks for talking with us about photography. Let's check out some of the amazing pictures from this expedition. Working at the National Air and Space Museum has a lot of perks. We get to work with some amazing people, including our awesome photographers. They take pictures of our artifacts, as well as document the events here at the museum. Let's take a look at some of their work. I am uh, Jim Preston. I'm the supervising photographer here at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. Uh, I've only been here for about five years now after a long photography career, both in newspapers and the Navy, and uh, actually a little bit at the White House. Having been someone who's basically traveled the world and done photography, to be here at this point at the end of my career as a photographer, uh, it, it's just an amazing experience. To see the faces of adults and children experience in this place has just been phenomenal. And I, you know, I, I see that through my photography. Um, you know, being able to capture that in my photography uh, is, is really one of the most rewarding experiences right now. We serve almost every everyone here at this museum. Um, I serve you right now. Um, we document you guys sometimes to show the job that you do. So we basically document all the work that happens here at the museum. You know, there are a lot of people that can't come to this museum physically and, and through the online galleries and stuff that we produce, you can actually see an awful lot of the museum, especially the new galleries that we've now, you know, put together and, and experience at least some of that. There's just something different from being on this side of a camera and getting, you know, I love shooting people more than anything, you know. I, I certainly love nature and, um, and documenting and photographing aircraft. We were actually moving the original Bright Flyer from its old gallery into the new gallery. The team was basically taking, had taken the airplane partially apart, but they took it out, lowered it, and then moved it through the building into the new half of the building into its new place. And I was part of that that day, you know, with the Wright Flyer. The very next day, I was out at Ubarhazi, and I was inside the space shuttle Discovery, and I had I just had to pinch myself and go, you know, in one day's time, I basically just spanned the age of aviation. It was one of those pinch me moments, you know. That it, it's just amazing, um, you know, to be part of that. The camera is this license to, to take me anywhere, and. We basically capture and share this, everything that happens in this museum with the world. You all did some great work today. Next step, putting your artwork on display. All right, everybody gather in for a picture because pics or it didn't happen. Once our students picked their favorite photograph, they wrote labels. You see labels in museums all the time, but do you know how to write one? Follow these three simple steps. Number one, figure out what you want to say. What do you want your viewer to know or learn? What story do you want to tell? 
And what does it say about your work? Step two, be brief and to the point. Think about what you want to say, but be concise. 100 words or less is best. And don't overwhelm your visitor. Number three, decide on a format and stick to it. Most labels contain a title, artist, and date. And there may be other things like the process or materials you'd like to add. Decide on what's important and stick to it. Teachers, check out our teacher tips for a more in-depth lesson on creating a gallery with your students. Well, I think our young photographers did a fabulous job. You should come by the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center to check out their work. And if you like this episode, be sure to follow STEM in 30 on Facebook and Twitter and subscribe to the National Air and Space Museum's YouTube channel. And teachers, be sure to check out our teacher tips document with ways to use this episode in your classroom. Thanks for watching.